Good morning, everybody, and a uh, very warm welcome to our traditional service this morning on Father's Day. So, uh, happy Father's Day to all fathers watching online. And uh, this morning, we're in the fourth week of our sermon series on prayer, entitled, Lord, Teach Us to Pray. And James will be preaching on forgiveness, forgive us our sins or debts, as we forgive those who sin against us, our debtors. That will be a little later in the service, but now we are going to commence our service with our first hymn. We're going to praise God. God moves in a mysterious way. In Psalm 32, we read, Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against, and in whose spirit is no deceit. This morning, our service of morning prayer comes from the Sunday Services book, but uh, most of the service will appear on the screen for you. So those who have the book, we are on page 9. We are the people of God. The scripture reminds us that we still sin. We need to confess our failures, knowing that Jesus intercedes for us with the Father, who freely forgives us. So let us draw near to God with sincerity and confidence and say this prayer of confession, which is on the screen, let's say this together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbour as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. 
We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us. Help us to love you and our neighbour and to live for your honour and glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, our God fulfils his promises and is true to his word. We have confessed our sins. God has forgiven us because Christ died for us. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Now, well, we are shortly going to hear from God's word, but let's pray this prayer together first. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us, showing us the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to have our second hymn before our Bible readings. The hymn is, Father, hear the prayer we offer. The Old Testament Bible reading is from the 32nd Psalm. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me, my strength was sapped, as in the heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and did not cover my, uh, my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore let all the faithful pray to you, while you, you may still be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. Do not be like the horse or the mule 
which have no understanding, but must be controlled by bit and br bridle, or they will not come to you. Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love surrounds the one who trusts in him. Rejoice in the Lord and be glad, you righteous. Sing, all you who are upright in heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. New Testament reading is from 1 John chapter 1, reading verses 5 to 10, and chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Light and darkness, sin and forgiveness. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have an advocate in the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to God. The Holy Gospel is written in the 18th chapter of the Gospel according to St. Matthew, beginning at the 21st verse. Glory to you, Lord Christ. The parable of the unmerciful servant. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So he began the settlement man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this the servant fell on his knee before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could repay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all the debts of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Well, we will now stand, we're not already 
be standing and say together the Apostles' Creed, which will appear on the screen. Together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, James will now come and give us our sermon for the day. Well, it's very good to, to be back here again. And uh, bringing you uh, God's Word, uh, expounding God's Word uh, this morning. As Chiz said, we are now halfway actually through a sermon series on prayer, and this is the fourth sermon on the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples when they asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. And it's uh, been delightful actually over the last few weeks that a number of you have told me that you are praying this prayer more often. Or, because that's your usual habit, you are thinking more about what you're praying and the words that you're saying. And that is just what Jesus would have wanted. Because he gave this prayer as a set prayer. Uh, just like other rabbis of the period gave their disciples prayers to say. And from the first century until today, the church has said this prayer on a daily basis. And part of the reason why set prayers are so vital is that we are so easily distracted. I don't mean distracted while we are praying, oh look, there's a bird, although of course that does happen. I mean that the prayers themselves can be exercises in distraction. Because it is so easy to concentrate only on the urgent and forget the truly important. Our prayers themselves can become an expression of whatever is in our uh, head or our heart at the time. If we're worried about X, Y and Z, then that's what we'll pray about. And that's fine to an extent. Let's not pretend to be something we're not before God. But the beauty of a set prayer is that it establishes the truly important so that we are not distracted by the merely urgent. A famous Christian once wrote, okay, I admit, it was C.S. Lewis, in set prayers, the permanent shape of Christianity shines through. And the permanent shape of Christianity shines through the Lord's Prayer before all other prayers. And today we will be looking at a line that really does capture the permanent shape of Christianity, maybe more than any other. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. If you know anything about Christianity, we know that it is about forgiveness. And whether we are a Christian or not, forgiveness is an issue for all of us. All of us live among imperfect people who wrong us, and not once but many times. And we ourselves are imperfect and wrong others repeatedly as well. And this causes strong reactions and deep emotions, and some of us may carry wounds from past events even now, or live in challenging situations in marriages or families where we are being continually hurt by others. How should we respond? 
Again, whether we are Christian or not, we know that forgiveness is a good thing. But we also know that it can be hard, very hard, sometimes beyond us. And yet, if we are Christians, we know that there are stark warnings in the Bible about refusing to forgive, as we shall see. So, we are on very serious ground here. And despite the familiarity we may feel about the topic, there is also a lot of misunderstanding about forgiveness. So my goal today is to provide some clarity around forgiveness, about what it truly is and what it practically means to pray this line in the Lord's Prayer. All this within 25 minutes, I know, hopelessly ambitious, but do... If you are uh, and would like to follow the blog readings during the week and uh, I'll be able to elaborate more on what I say today in those. So I'm going to explain this prayer in a single sentence and it starts with these words. As disciples of Christ, we are already forgiven. The Lord had taught us to say, forgive us our sins, or debts, as the original Greek says. But we pray this prayer as his disciples. We are already forgiven. This prayer is given to those who are already God's children in Jesus' mind. You may remember in verse 9 in Matthew, as we're looking at it in the prayer that we pray, it starts, our Father. The assumption of this prayer is that it is said by children who are already forgiven by their Heavenly Father and yet who ask Him for daily forgiveness. So what's going on here? Well, to understand this, you need to think of forgiveness in two ways. The first is there is macro forgiveness. So at a macro level, when you become a Christian, when you first turn to God and say, I've been in the wrong, I'm sorry, I turn from my sins, please forgive me, then you receive this forgiveness. The Apostle Paul writes about this experience of receiving God's forgiveness in his letter to the Church of Rome, quoting from Psalm 32, which was our Old Testament reading, blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. God cleanses the entirety of your life. You are forgiven on this macro level. But then there is another kind of forgiveness, which you might call micro forgiveness. It's forgiveness that's received daily from him. It's forgiveness that the other apostle John writes about in his first letter, which was our New Testament reading. When addressing Christians, he says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. John recognises that just as we are Christians, we still need to regularly confess our sins and receive forgiveness. And that's how families work, isn't it? Because we all know that family bonds are strengthened with lots of, well, I'm sorry, followed by, well, I forgive you, or that's okay. And, and a family that falls out with each other but easily says sorry and, um, and easily forgives is actually far healthier than a family that rarely argues but never apologises. So it is in our relationship with God. It's our privilege as part of his family daily to seek this micro-forgiveness as his children already forgiven. And therefore the Lord's Prayer is a lovely reminder that even the very prayerful are never elevated above their sins. There's a temptation, isn't there, if you ever get your prayer life together, to think that you've somehow floated above your sins, or at least above the sins of other people. But the Lord's Prayer has this built-in reminder that the prayerful are still sinful. We are always saying, forgive us our sins. We're always coming back to the Lord. 
We are unable to make up for, for our sins, unable to pay our debt, but always able to draw on his credit. And as we forgive, as we confess our sins to our loving Heavenly Father, we grow. We grow in assurance we, that we have been forgiven. The knowledge that we are forgiven in Christ. And we grow in holiness, that we are transformed into the likeness of Christ. And so this prayer is not so much an obligation, but it's a beautiful gift. Because you're not coming to God as a mentally a manic schoolmaster who's punishing us, but as a merciful Heavenly Father who loves us. This is the permanent shape of Christianity. So, as disciples of Christ, we are already forgiven. But now we come to the most challenging part of the line, as we forgive those who sin against us. What does this mean? Well, as disciples of Christ, we are already forgiven, unless we fail to forgive others. And this is not just there in verse 12 in the body of the prayer, <coughs> Matthew 6. It's, always repeat, it's also repeated in verses 14 and 15 when Jesus goes on to say, For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Well, that certainly focuses the mind, doesn't it? Jesus explains in these verses the reasons for the prayer in verse 12, such as its importance. And there's no question this is a very challenging statement. But if we're not careful, the intention of Jesus to challenge us on this issue can become unnecessarily oppressive in our lives. So, think he caps on this morning. Forgive us our uh, sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Well, that fits neatly into the general pattern of Jesus' teaching. Jesus thought there was an intimate connection between the vertical and the horizontal, between your relationship with God and your relationship with other human beings. How you connect to God and how you connect to others. And he would not allow these two things to become separate, as they so often were in his culture. So long as I've worshipped to the temple and offered my sacrifices and given my tithes, it doesn't matter how I treat other human beings. And Jesus came along saying, well, no, actually, it does matter. So when he asked, when he was asked what was the greatest commandment in the law, he said there were two. He wouldn't play the game that there was just one. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So, it makes sense then that Jesus will connect our forgiveness of others with our forgiveness from God. The vertical and the horizontal intimately connected in the teaching of Jesus. But what does it exactly mean? Well, fortunately, we have a commentary on this line of the Lord's Prayer. Not by some great scholar, but by Jesus himself. And that was our Gospel reading from Matthew chapter 18. This is Jesus' exposition of the line as we forgive those who sin against us. So, Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 21. You might like to put it up in your Bibles. The parable of the unmerciful servant. And as we go through this, let's just see how the vertical and the horizontal are connected by Jesus. So we are told that a servant owes a king, in verse 24, 10,000 bags of gold. And that's literally 10,000 talents. And 10,000 is the largest Greek Numeral and a talent is the largest unit of currency. It works out to be about 200,000 years of a day labourer's salary. 
So today in Sydney, an unskilled labourer earns about 50k a year. So this debt amounts to 10 billion dollars. So a ridiculously large amount of money. And all those listening to Jesus will be laughing and saying, well, no one has that amount of money. And that's the point. And so the servant <coughs> begs the king for mercy. And in what we only can be irony, he says, be patient with me and I will pay everything back. Verse 26. But it's 200,000 years of salary. It's impossible. Be patient with me. Well, we're all meant to go, ha, ah, ridiculous. And the theological point is, of course, that we also have an astronomically large debt with God. And it's impossible to pay back. So what does the king do? Well, the servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt, and let him go. The debt is written off. The servant absolutely forgiven. Just imagine being forgiven ten billion dollars. Wow. And then the next scene. The servant meets a second servant who owes him a hundred silver coins, literally denarii, which is a hundred days of a labourer's salary. So about twenty thousand dollars today. And the first servant grabs him by the throat, demanding payment. And it would take a while, but he could pay it back. And in verse 29, the second servant begs the first, using pretty much the same words as the first servant said to the king, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But the first servant doesn't cancel the debt. He refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Well, suffice it to say, it ends badly for the first servant. The king hears about it, calls the first servant in and says, didn't I forgive you $10 billion? And you can't forgive 20000 You have forfeited forgiveness. Chilling, isn't it? Jesus' point is clear. If we are unwilling to forgive, we may find ourselves among the unforgiven. If we are unwilling to forgive, we may find ourselves among the unforgiven. But you may ask, well, James, does this mean forfeiting micro-forgiveness? Uneasy, uncomfortable, ongoing relationships with God the Father, but still in the family. Or does it mean forfeiting macro-forgiveness, no longer in the family at all? And in answer to that question, perhaps I should just read verse 34. In his anger, the master handed him, the first servant, over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. So, do we want to take the risk of unforgiveness? But, and it's a very big but, there is a subtle and vital clarification about the nature of forgiveness. As disciples of Christ, we are already forgiven unless we fail to forgive others who plead for forgiveness. On the evening of uh, the 1st of February 2020, a drunken driver Samuel Davidson's speeding ute mounted the curb on Bettington Road in Oakland and ploughed into a small group of children walking to an ice cream shop. Four children were killed at the scene, including the siblings Anthony, Angelina and Sienna Abdallah. The day after the incident, the parents faced the media and they said they forgave the driver. We have forgiven him so we are able to grieve peacefully uh, later said. It's both shocking and moving. But here's a question. 
Why did the Abdullahs say that? And what does it actually mean? Uh, they are Christians from a Maronite denomination in the Eastern Catholic tradition. In saying what they did, we have forgiven him. The day after the accident, before the driver had expressed any contrition, what were they saying and why did they say it? Did they believe that they had to unilaterally forgive Samuel Davidson to be forgiven by God? Or did they mean that they had to let go of their negative feelings towards Samuel Davidson? Or maybe it was a combination of both. Now, I don't want to belittle what they said in any way. I just can't imagine their pain and their grief. And their reaction was admirable and perhaps psychologically beneficial. But it does not mean that Samuel Davidson is forgiven. The Bible does not teach that you are to forgive those who do not seek your forgiveness. In fact, it teaches that unless the offender requests forgiveness, then they cannot be forgiven. In a brilliant little book entitled Forgiveness, Julia Marston rightly says, forgiveness is a two-sided transaction. It takes two to complete it. In the Bible, forgiveness requires a recognition of wrongdoing, a plea for forgiveness, and a commitment to lead a new life. This is called repentance. So think about this theologically for a moment. God doesn't forgive us without our repentance, without our debtor's plea, without saying, Lord, I, I can't play. Please forgive me. And that's when God forgives. And I don't think he expects any different from us. And this is quite clear in the parable. In verse 26, the first servant pleads the king for mercy and that's when the king forgives and similarly the second servant pleads for mercy from the first servant and that's when the first servant doesn't forgive my point is that jesus teaches that we must forgive if we have been forgiven for god but only because he's assuming that those have requested release from their moral debt towards us. So this is the definition of forgiveness in the Bible. It is the free granting of a request to be freed from a moral debt. Forgiveness in the Bible is the free granting of a request to be freed from a moral debt. Now, don't misunderstand me. This, because it, it's in the nuances that all the action is. The, the Bible does call on us to love our enemies, whether they ask for forgiveness or not. We are to love those who despise us and mistreat us. And when Jesus talks about loving our enemies, he, he means not retaliating. He means turning the other cheek. He means praying for those who persecute you, blessing them instead of cursing. And this is what the gospel demands of us. And that is just like God, isn't it? God loves the sinner without an apology. But he only forgives when there is repentance. That's the assumption. We are also called upon to forgive those who request forgiveness. So when we pray this prayer, this part of the Lord's Prayer, we are simultaneously asking God to release us from our moral debt towards him and we are promising to grant anyone else's request to release their moral debt towards us. Now I am very conscious that this is one of those precarious moments in a pastor's life that come around every now and then. The risk is the wrong person will hear the wrong message today. Some of you watching today will have been profoundly hurt by people who have never come and asked your forgiveness and it's clear they have no intention of doing so. And you live with a sense of betrayal and deep wounds and 
you hear what I've been saying today and you may think, oh my goodness, the Lord won't forgive me unless I find a way to forgive that person. But that is not what the Lord is saying to you today. Of course he wants you to seek that person's good, to pray for them, to bless them even when they curse you, but he's not asking you to release them from that moral debt before they repent and ask for forgiveness. Now others of you, I fear, will hear what I'm saying and be thinking, I've been looking away, looking for a way to nurse that resentment against that person who asked me for forgiveness in the past, and I'm still holding them to account and, and holding it over them, and they have a long way to go before they pay it off. Well, this is not what the Lord is saying to you today either. You have been pardoned of an immense debt before God, and that person in your life who has sought your forgiveness must have your forgiveness. Because if we're not willing to do this, we may find that we have never known the mercy of God, and never will. And if we forgive us our sins, we'll fall on deaf ears. Whatever our situation, whatever the complexities of forgiveness, and it is very complex, the antidote is to ponder the unimaginable debt that we have been forgiven by God and the inexpressible grace He has granted us in Jesus Christ. Every one of us has been forgiven 200,000 lifetimes of salary. Wow! $10 billion of debt, at least gone. That is what just one billion looks like in hundred dollar bills. So multiply that by 10. 10 billion dollars. A debt that in the ancient world meant a lifetime of slavery for us, our spouse, our children, their children, their children's children, into perpetuity. 10 billion, gone. But not just written off, but paid off. Forgiveness is free for us, but it was immensely costly for God. To provide. It cost him his son. Jesus died to pay off our impossible debt and not just to wipe the slate clean but that we might have the incomparable riches of his grace and glorious inheritance as his adopted children. Impossible debt to unimaginable wealth. So if you are struggling to forgive today, ponder your 10 billion debt cancelled. But also pray, pray that God will, through His Spirit, enable you to forgive. We must have seen God is holding this obligation over us like a big stick. He is our loving Heavenly Father. He is pastorally and carefully helping us to navigate what is uneven and scary ground. And He's in it with us, assuring us of our forgiveness and giving us the resources to do it as someone who has forgiven at great cost to Himself. And only when we know His love as our Father, only when we know His forgiveness through His Son, only when we know His power through His Spirit in us, will we be able to forgive as He does. At cost to ourselves, but freely for others. So as disciples of Christ, we are already forgiven, unless we fail to forgive others who plead for forgiveness. So let's prepare our hearts to offer the forgiveness we have received. Let's pray. Blessed is the person whose sin in the Lord will never be counted against them. Heavenly Father, 
thank you for your free and full forgiveness in Christ. Please help us to forgive as we have been forgiven. Nothing more, but nothing less. In Jesus' name. Well, as we continue in prayer, and we start our prayers with the Lord's Prayer, let's um, consider that enormous debt that Jesus has paid for us. And as we come to that line in the prayer, let's just, I'll just pause for a few seconds afterwards as we consider that. So the Lord's Prayer will appear on the screen. The Lord be with you. And also, also with you. let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Be exalted, Lord, above the heavens. Let your glory cover the earth. Keep our nation under your care, and guide us in justice and truth. Let your way be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Send out your light and truth that we may tell of your saving works. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for we put our trust in you. Uh, those of you who have the Sunday Services book at home, our first prayer can be found at the bottom of page 24. This is a prayer of thanksgiving. Almighty God, Creator and Redeemer, we praise you for your work of creation for the beauty of the world around us, and for every gift we enjoy. We bless you for creating us to know you, love and obey you. Most of all, we thank you for your amazing love in sending your Son to destroy, to restore your world, to die for us, and to give us life in all its fullness. Accept, O God, our praise and thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now a prayer for Father's Day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our fathers, for giving us life and for nurturing and caring for us. We pray that you would guide them and all fathers and those in that role to fulfil this vocation following your model of love, grace and sacrifice. On this day, we especially pray for new fathers. Give them a fresh understanding of your fatherhood of them. For fathers we have lost, who have lost children or whose children are suffering, give them your peace and perseverance. And for those whose fathers are no longer with us, give them the joy of memories and hope of reunion through the resurrection of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now a few prayers of supplication. God of everlasting love, who provides all things, we pray for all people. Make your way known to them, your saving power among all nations. We bring before you the people of Afghanistan and of other places of economic strife, disruption and war. Be living bread to those who are hungry each day. Be healing and wholeness to those who have no access to health care. Be their true home to all who have been displaced. Be open arms of loving acceptance to those who fear because of their gender, ethnicity, religious or political views. Be peace to those engaged in armed conflict 
and those who live within its shadow. Turn our hearts and minds to your ways of just and gentle peace. Open our eyes to see you in all acts of compassionate care and strengthen our hearts to step out in solidarity with your suffering people. We, uh, we pray now for our leaders, first for Elizabeth, our Queen, for the Prime Minister of Australia, Scott Morrison, Premier of New South Wales, Gladys Berejiklian, and all who have leadership responsibility, who make and administer our laws and all men and women in their daily work. Give wisdom to those in authority in every land and guide all people in the way of righteousness and peace so that they may share with justice the resources of the earth, work together in trust and seek the common good. And we pray for the welfare of your church here on earth, guided and governed by your spirit so that all who call themselves Christians may be led in the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. We pray for Kanishka, our Archbishop, Chris, our Regional Bishop, James, our Senior Minister, Jeremy, our Assistant Minister, Anne, our Care Pastor, Ben, our Kids and Youth Minister, and Jenny, our Church Administrator, and all who serve you at St John's. We also commend to your fatherly goodness all who are afflicted or distressed in body, mind or circumstances. Especially today we pray for the 10 o'clock as Michelle Bain, Catherine Purden Gray and Jenny Bishop, all undergoing cancer treatment. Please relieve them according to their needs, giving them peace in their sufferings and deliverance from their afflictions. Finally, Heavenly Father, we bring before you our school-aged children as they continue to learn from home, and Year 12 students as they complete their high school certificate exams. Please focus their minds on their work and uphold parents balancing work, schooling and life in lockdown. We also ask for your guiding hand in the absence of scripture teaching in government schools during the lockdown. May ways be found to bring the gospel to those children and remind them of your promises embodied in your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray all these things. Amen. Well, we end our prayers today with a collect, which will appear on the screen. God our Father, you redeem us and make us your children in Christ. Look on us. Give us true freedom and bring us to the inheritance you promised. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Well, we are now going to have our final hymn. And our final hymn is Thine Forever, God of Love.
Well, let me tell you a little bit about what's, um, what's happening and uh, St John's and I'll finish with something that's a bit silly but um, quite enjoyable. Firstly, uh, do if you'd like to, uh, hold your smartphone up on the screen and, and scan in. Um, this is just to let us know that you're watching, uh, but also we give you an opportunity to connect with us and say anything you would like to say or some prayer points and uh, as, a, as a staff team then we go through those uh, during the week and we'll be praying uh, for you and following up on anything that you'd like uh, to let us know. So uh, do that um, now or you may have done it at the beginning of, of the service so thank you for, for doing that. Next uh, Sunday uh, we have a, a the, the pleasure of the uh, Mike and Jackie Hammond who uh, are coming at least not in person but certainly on the screen. Although they are in, in Australia and in Sydney, they are in the wrong side of the M2, so they're in the Parramatta LGA and sadly cannot come to church here. But nevertheless, through the wonders of technology, um, we'll be seeing an interview uh, which I've already recorded with them. And also Mike will be preaching and, um, and he'll be on, on the screen uh, preaching. Um, and then during the following week and indeed other weeks as well, and they'll be visiting uh, growth groups uh, again online. So if you are a growth group leader um, and then please uh, contact uh, Mike or Jackie. So the details are in, in the news sheet that you will have received in the uh, Friday email. So um, looking forward to uh, seeing them at least uh, in two dimensions uh, tomorrow, uh, next uh, Sunday. Let's have a look at this. Like that over the last 
couple of months and sadly will be probably for uh, at least another month. Um, but with all the silliness there, a serious message. Um, although we may be stuck in the house on Sunday and the online church, we're doing church the online way. Nevertheless, we are encouraged to uh, still gather together as we can and encourage one another in doing that. So thank you for all of you who are doing that and uh, for that mutual encouragement that we can give one another. Let's finish with the lesson. So for all those stuck in the house on Sunday, let, let us encourage each other with the words of the grace which should appear on the screen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, today we've been reminded that we have been forgiven of an almost unimaginable, enormous debt before God by His grace in Jesus Christ. And Jesus connects our relationship with God to our relationship with others. And we've heard that forgiveness is a two way. Uh, a two-sided transaction, perhaps within a two-sided transaction. So, as disciples of Christ, we are already forgiven unless we fail to forgive others who themselves have asked for forgiveness. Thank you for joining us in our live stream service today and we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.